Every year, over 150 million cubic meters of plywood are produced worldwide. Enough to have a train of wagons loaded with these sheets circle the earth at the equator several times. But how is an ordinary tree trunk turned into this unique material, used in furniture, construction, and even shipbuilding? What secrets does the process hide, starting with spa treatments for logs and ending with a hot press where layers of wood are permanently bonded into a monolith? Watch until the end and you'll learn about the secret pencil that remains after production and why it too has its own value. It all starts in the forest, where the best specimens are selected for plywood production. You need perfectly straight, cylindrical trunks without a large number of knots or defects, preferably from birch, alder, or pine. After delivery to the factory, the logs undergo the first and very important stage of preparation, hydrothermal treatment. They are submerged in giant pools of hot water, where they spend several hours and sometimes a whole day. This kind of spa for logs has a purely practical purpose. The hot water softens the wood, making it more plastic and pliable. Without this, further processing would be impossible. After the bath, the logs are fed to a line where their bark is stripped off. Special machines quickly and efficiently clean the trunk, leaving a smooth, light surface. The heart of the entire plywood production process is the peeling lathe. This is where something incredible happens. The prepared log, clamped at both ends, begins to rotate at a huge speed around its axis. A long, razor-sharp knife is slowly brought towards it. As it cuts into the wood, it begins to peel off not shavings, but a continuous, seamless ribbon just one or two millimeters thick. It's like unrolling a giant roll of paper towels. The machine literally unrolls the trunk like a scroll of ancient papyrus, turning a three-dimensional cylinder into a flat, long ribbon. This ribbon is called veneer. The long sheet of veneer moves further down the conveyor, where giant clippers chop it into sheets of standard size. All that's left of the log is a thin central cylinder, the so-called pencil, which is then used for other purposes. Freshly made veneer contains a lot of moisture, which is an enemy of the strength of the future plywood. Therefore, the next mandatory stage is drying. The veneer sheets are fed into long, multi-tiered drying chambers. Inside them, as if on the shelves of a giant cabinet, the sheets slowly move on a conveyor while hot air intensely blows on them from all sides. In a few minutes, the damp and flexible sheets turn into light, slightly brittle, and perfectly dry blanks. At this stage, the dried veneer sheets are sorted by quality. Then they pass through a glue spreading machine. Special rollers, dipped in a bath of synthetic glue, apply a uniform, sticky film to one side of every other sheet. Next begins the process of forming the layup. A dry sheet of veneer is placed on a table, and on top of it, a sheet coated with glue. And here lies the main secret. Each subsequent sheet is laid so that the direction of its grain is perpendicular to the previous one. If the first sheet's grain runs lengthwise, then the second's runs crosswise, and the third's lengthwise again. This cross-grain structure is the key to plywood strength. It paralyzes the wood's natural tendency to split, 
and evenly distributes the load. That's why plywood is equally strong in all directions. The number of layers in the layup is always odd, so that the structure is symmetrical. The form layups of veneer are fed to the most powerful section of production, the hot press. This is a giant multi-story structure between whose plates several dozen future plywood sheets are loaded simultaneously. With an enormous force reaching tens of kilograms per square centimeter, the plates compress the veneer layups. At the same time, the plates are heated to a temperature of 150 degrees Celsius. Under the influence of high pressure and temperature, the glue polymerizes, permanently bonding the layers into a single, incredibly strong monolith. Hot sheets of plywood come out from under the press and are stacked for gradual cooling. After this, they undergo final processing. Powerful circular saws trim the edges, giving the sheets precise geometric dimensions. Then comes sanding. The sheets pass through sanding machines with endless abrasive belts, which make their surface perfectly smooth. After this, each sheet undergoes strict quality control. Inspectors check it for defects, delaminations, knots, or glue spots. Depending on the surface quality, the plywood is assigned a certain grade, and a marking is applied to it. The finished stacks of plywood are sent to the warehouse to later become part of furniture, houses, and ships. The pencil that remains after peeling the veneer is a vivid example of how modern production strives for maximum waste-free efficiency. It is not waste, but a valuable raw material. If the cylinder is massive enough, it is sent to a sawing line where it gets a second life in the form of lumber. Small boards and bars are cut from it, which are ideal for creating the invisible but strong frames for sofas and armchairs, legs for chairs, elements of children's beds, or wooden pallets. One billion, three hundred million meters of submarine internet cables have already been laid on the ocean floors. And every year, this length grows. Also, we can send a message, watch a video, or make a call across continents. Over 95% of all intercontinental internet traffic passes through them every day. Stretched through the depths, they cross volcanic ridges, encounter sharks, ships, and even geopolitics. How are these gigantic infrastructures created? Who designs the routes? How are they laid on the seabed at depths of over 26,000 feet? And what happens when a cable is damaged? For the internet to cross oceans, a cable is needed that can withstand pressure, salt water, marine life, and decades of operation without repair. It all starts with the central core, a copper or aluminum conductor, through which the main signal travels. Large ingots of purified metal are melted and passed through drawing machines, which repeatedly pull the material through narrowing dies, reducing the diameter to a few millimeters. At this stage, a perfectly round cross-section is formed, one that has no microcracks or air pockets. After drawing, the wire undergoes heat treatment. It is heated to a precisely set temperature to relieve internal stress and make it more flexible. Then it is cleaned of oxides, often by a chemical method, or using abrasive rollers. The output is a shiny, smooth, almost flawless wire. It is checked automatically for diameter, resistance, flexibility, and surface purity. The wire must withstand kilometers of bending and work without failure, even at depths of several thousand feet. Depending on the type of cable, the wire is either used as a single solid conductor or is twisted from several thinner strands, which increases flexibility and protection against breakage. 
Once the copper or aluminum conductor is ready, it is immediately fed into an extrusion line, a long machine resembling a tunnel. Inside, polyethylene heated to 482 degrees Fahrenheit, which melts into a thick, viscous cream. The conductor moves along a conveyor and enters the extruder head, where the molten polymer precisely and evenly flows around the metal, like a second body. Every millisecond is important here. Too slow, and drips will form. Too fast, the polyethylene won't have time to adhere. Immediately after this, the cable enters a bath of cooling water, where the polyethylene layer quickly solidifies, tightly enveloping the conductor. The entire surface must be smooth, without a single bubble or crack. This is the first line of defense against moisture. After cooling, inspection. Lasers measure the insulation thickness, and cameras check the surface. If anything is even slightly off, the cable is cut and reprocessed. The next stage is the application of a hydrophobic gel, which acts as an invisible protector. This thick, viscous compound fills all the voids inside the cable, envelops the optical fibers, and creates an internal shield against moisture. In a special chamber, the cable passes through a system of nozzles or rotating heads that evenly apply the gel to the central part and in the space between the fiber elements. The gel resembles a transparent lubricant. It doesn't dry out, freeze, or dissolve in water, even at a depth of 26,000 feet under a pressure of hundreds of atmospheres. Its main property is to repel water. If the cable sheath is ever breached, the gel instantly spreads and prevents moisture from penetrating inside, not letting it reach the sensitive fibers. At this stage, it's also important that there isn't too much gel, otherwise it complicates the further laying of layers, and not too little. Then the protection efficiency drops. Computers precisely regulate the dosage, and operators visually check the filling and uniformity. After application, a short cooling and stabilization. Now the cable is ready to receive its optical heart, the fiber threads that transmit light from one continent to another. These fibers, usually from four to 12 of them, are first grouped into modules. Each module is a flexible capsule with several fibers inside, providing additional protection. The modules are very carefully arranged in a spiral around the central conductor. This configuration allows the fibers to bend without tension, especially during winding and laying the cable at sea. To keep the fibers in place, they are fixed in a bedding of gel that was applied earlier. There is no glue, only a tight fit and a flexible structure. It's important that no fiber crosses another, breaks, or shifts from its place. The work is almost like jewelry making, although it's done on a conveyor. Afterward, a continuity check of each fiber. A laser beam is sent through them. Even a micro crack or a bend will cause a failure, and the fiber won't pass inspection. If everything is fine, the structure moves on to the next stage, additional insulation and reinforcement. First, an additional polymer layer is applied over the optical fiber structure. Often it's high-density polyethylene, or another flexible waterproof material. It protects against mechanical damage, friction, and moisture. This is again done in an extruder, similar to the one where the first insulation layer was applied. The cable passes through molten polymer and immediately enters a cooling bath. After cooling, the cable enters the steel wire braiding section. Machines evenly lay steel rods or tapes in a spiral around the already insulated core. In shallow water areas, this armor is thicker to protect against anchors, fishing nets, and shark teeth. At depth, the armor is thinner or absent altogether. After reinforcement, another outer polymer sheath may be added, which seals the entire structure. Operators carefully inspect the cable surface, checking for uniform thickness, no abrasions, burrs, cracks, or armor misalignments. Then, automated tests. Lasers scan the thickness. Cameras capture every millimeter. Light pulses are sent through the fibers again. The signal must pass without delays or losses. If a defect is found at this stage, it is cut out and both ends are joined using a special technology, creating a sealed splice joint. After inspection, the cable enters the marking section. Here, information about the batch, production date, cable type, and its purpose is printed on the outer sheath. Often, every few feet, so it's easy to identify the cable even during laying on the seabed. And finally, winding onto spools. These are giant drums with a diameter of up to 13 or 16 feet, which can hold up to 8,200 feet of cable. Each turn must lie flat, without twists, and with uniform tension. Automatic systems regulate the speed and tension force, and operators monitor each stage. If the cable is intended for installation at sea, the drums are immediately sent to ships, where they are installed on the deck. If not, they're stored in special warehouses with humidity control, because even minor corrosion can be fatal.